I'm going to talk today about epic failure. Anybody do social media? I know some of you do social media, and you've heard this term, epic fail, right? You'll, you'll, see, you'll see epic fail, and then either some video or a picture of, of something like, a, a, you know, somebody slipped and fell, and it was funny because they didn't get hurt or whatever, or somebody was skateboarding and, you know, bashed into a wall, and they laughed, and we all laughed, and it's you know, epic fail, right? You ever heard that term, epic fail? I, and... The two words just don't seem to go together. Like epic means larger than normal, right? It's like an epic novel. It, it, it almost has legendary sort of a connotation to it. Like legendary and larger than normal, larger than life. That's what epic means. And of course, you put that with fail. It's like a failure that's larger than life. But you think, well, man, most failures are bad enough. Do we need to make it worse? But here's how the Urban Dictionary, it's not like Webster's, okay, it's like the slang dictionary. The Urban Dictionary as, uh, defines epic fail as complete and total failure when success should have been reasonably easy to obtain. <laughs> All right? <laughs> like, it shouldn't be that hard. And you blew it. Okay, that's epic fail, right? And, and so now you know what epic fail is. And, of course, if, if, you, just, if you type in epic fail on Google or on YouTube, you, you, you could watch for hours. Uh, some of the epic failures you should not be watching because I, just be careful. Don't let your kids type epic fail on YouTube because you're going to see a lot of things you should not see because some things are what they call wardrobe malfunctions. Remember that from the Super Bowl a few years ago? You don't want your kids seeing that stuff. So I, uh, but, but there was an epic fail. When we say epic fail, right, it should be reasonably easy to obtain and you failed. I saw one on Tuesday. And maybe you saw it. Uh, you know, at, at baseball games, they ha always have somebody kind of famous throughout the first pitch, right, in all the baseball games. Well, last Tuesday, the Mets were playing, I forget who they were playing, Pirates or somebody, and uh, they had a, a, a rapper, 50 Cent. You don't call him 50 Cent, you've got to call him 50 Cent, right? 50 Cent. His name's Curtis Jackson, right? But nobody knows him as Curtis Jackson, he's 50 Cent. And uh, he threw out the first pitch at, at the Mets game. Did anybody see that first pitch? All right, for those of you who missed it because you didn't see Epic Fail on Facebook, I'm going to play that for you. So here's 50 Cent throwing out the first pitch. Well, that is uh, 50 Cent. Curtis Jackson? Curtis Jackson. And his first pitch was not great. Just a bit outside. What can you say? I think he opened up a little early. Uh, I, I, yeah, so he got that front shoulder. It's good. He never had a choice between uh, playing for the Mets or being a rapper. So. He else was, uh, but but not all epic fails are funny, right? I mean, we laugh at that and it's funny, and we got a yuck out of it, and he got a yuck out of it. He's probably like, I was just thinking like, maybe would you like just go in the backyard and throw a few, you know, just to. Kind of see if maybe you kind of get it, I don't know, get it close anyway. But some failures aren't so funny. And, and today they're actually, and we've got to get serious now because um, a lot of people are spiritually and emotionally injured because of failure, of, of, of their failure, failures they've experienced or been responsible for or what, whatever. Um, and, and this really I, this didn't hit me until I, I was just reading through uh, John. We're, we're com actually completing our series in the book of John today. And we're in John 21. And as I was reading through that, this whole the Lord just began to speak to me about on this area of failure because it's such a, it's an area we don't talk a lot about and we don't handle very well. And, and a lot of Christians, because they've not learned how to view failure and how to handle failure, are, are really kind of, kind of messed up and, and, and it, it's actually injured it can be it, it can injure people uh, emotionally because when when people feel like they're a failure it, it causes guilt and shame and, and condemnation and and when when people are experiencing guilt and shame and condemnation there's there's symptoms that arise out of that right anger uh, anxiety fear fear of fear of more failure um, depression there's, there's, so there's a lot of um, symptoms that as we look at that, we think, well, their problem is depression. That's not the problem. The problem is they, of how they view their failures in life. 
that leads to depression, or they're just angry. Their problem is anger. Well, the real problem really isn't anger. I mean, it's a problem. It's a symptom. Their, their problem is, again, the, the way they view failure in their life and, and how that manifests make, might make them angry. And the list goes on and on and on. But there's good news. Today, Jesus wants you to be free from that, uh, the, the injuries that, that, that come from feeling like a failure. Because you might be thinking, well, I know people who have failed a lot in this. I wish they were here to hear this sermon. That's probably true. But I, I've talked to people who, at least from my vantage point, look like they got it going on. And they say, man, I'm such a failure. I'm like, are you kidding me? You're a failure? In what way? Because they just look like they're hitting on all cylinders. And maybe they are. They just, for whatever reason, got this thing in their head that they're a failure when they really aren't. Or maybe they really are, uh, they, and it was happening, and we just didn't see it or whatever. So, so this, this problem of failure and the injuries it causes and the way it manifests in our life is not just with messed up people, okay? It affects a lot of, I mean, it messes us up, but it doesn't, it's not always as readily apparent. But today, you can go from epic failure to epic faith. How would that be? If that's what Jesus wants to do. He wants to, wants to move you from failure to faith. Epic failure to epic faith. And so uh, we're going to look at the Bible today. You don't have to look very far in the Bible to find lots of examples of epic fail. Right? There's lots of failures in the Bible. And uh, here's, we're just going to read one today. There's, there's lots, but here's one. It's in John 18, starting in verse 15. Simon Peter and another disciple were following Jesus. Okay, this is the night before Jesus was uh, crucified. So this is, they'd, they'd been in the upper room. Uh, he washed their feet. They walked through the Mount of, Mount of Olives. They'd had communion together. And, and now uh, and they've come to arrest Jesus. And while they were doing that, Peter <laughs> got kind of impulsive and took his sword out and whacked off the ear of one of the guards and and Jesus said, like, Peter, not, put the sword away and took the ear, stuck it back on the guy's head, healed him immediately, put the ear, was healed. All right, so this is what's going on. So now Jesus has been taken away uh, into custody and Peter's standing outside. All right, that's the, okay. Um, Simon Peter and another disciple were following Jesus. Because this disciple was known to the high priest, that's John is the one he's talking about, he went with Jesus into the high priest's courtyard. But Peter had to wait outside at the door. The other disciple, who was known to the high priest, came back, spoke to the servant girl on duty, and brought Peter in. You aren't one of this man's disciples too, are you? She asked Peter. He replied, I am not. It was cold, and the servants and officials stood around a fire they had made to keep warm. Peter also was standing with them, warming himself. Now we jump down to verse 25. Meanwhile, Simon Peter was still standing there, warming himself, so they asked him, you aren't one of his disciples too, are you? He denied it again, saying, I am not. One of the high priest's servants, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, challenged him. Didn't I see you with him in the garden? Again, Peter denied it, and at that moment, a rooster began to crow. If you remember the story, Jesus said, before the rooster crows, you'll deny me three times. Well, there's this three times right there. And when you read it in other passages, when you read in the original language of Greek, one of those times when he denied it, he actually used profanity. <laughs> so it wasn't a, he, he was denying being um, attached to one of his closest friends. Peter and Jesus, had, had they, Peter was in the, like, the inner circle, the inner circle of the inner circle. And, and he had seen so many miraculous things that Jesus had done. And, and he's the one that, that voiced, you are the Messiah. That's Peter, and, 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 that's what, and he says, oh, Lord, you'll, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. I will never let you down. When all these other guys, when they're fleeing, when they're running, you can count on me. I'll always be there for you. And, and then we see him, like, the first time a little girl comes up, ah, mouse, he's, he's, like, denying Jesus. And so that's why I consider this an epic failure because it would seem like success should have been pretty, you know, pretty easy to obtain, right? 
I mean, here's, here's a guy that's been with Jesus, knew he was the Messiah, saw him do great miracles, uh, saw all these things, saw him be transfigured and all this kind of stuff. And, all, and, and then he gets questioned, like, aren't you with him? Like, no, no. Epic fail. Well, uh, failure had pretty much taken Peter out of the game for the next couple of weeks after this moment. When he denied Jesus, from that time for the next week or two, you, you don't hear much of, from Peter. Like, he, like, where is he? Well, we find him, we find him going back to kind of to his past. We find him in verse 21 fishing. Or not verse 21, chapter 21 of, of John. Chapter 21, he's fishing. And he's not fishing for men like Jesus told him to, to fish for. He's fishing for fish. And most guys are like, well, if I'm feeling bad, that's what I want to do. Right? I understand that. Let's go fishing, right? Maybe that's what he was doing. But he, he's fishing for fish. And so he's out with some of the other disciples, and they're, on, they're out in the boat, and they've fished all night. They haven't caught really anything. And they're about 100 yards from shore. And they see a guy on the shore, and he says, hey, have you caught anything? And they said, no, we haven't caught anything. He says, well, throw the net over on the other side of the boat, and you'll catch a bunch. And they threw it over there, and the, the, the net was so heavy they could hardly haul it in. Well, then Peter, like, it's the Lord. Because, see, he'd, been, he'd already died, been resurrected. They'd seen him a time or two, but this is like the third time now they're seeing him after his death and resurrection. And so Peter jumps out of the boat, swims and runs and goes on shore, and it's Jesus. All right. Um, so this is the guy that he's denied, <laughs> and, and now he's running towards him uh, onto the shore. And when he gets up there, Jesus already has breakfast. He's got fish that, that he's fried up and, and cooked or whatever, and, and so they're having breakfast. So let's pick up the story in John 21, verse 15. After breakfast, Jesus asked Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Let me explain what he's talking about. Remember when Peter said, you can count on me. When all these other guys are fleeing, you can count on me. Remember Peter saying that? So Jesus is saying, do you love me more than these guys love me? You, <laughs> and, and, Peter say, and Peter says this. He says, yes, Lord, Peter replied, you know I love you. Then feed my lambs, Jesus told him. Jesus repeated the question, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, Peter said, you know I love you. Then take care of my sheep, Jesus said. A third time he asked him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt that Jesus asked the question a third time. He said, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said, then feed my sheep. This is how Jesus deals with failure. All right? He didn't look to the past. He didn't dredge up the past. He's like, Peter, let's go back. Let's go back a couple weeks. I want to just take you back there. I want to, I want to let you know how that hurt me. I want to let you know how deeply hurt I was and what you did. He didn't do that. He didn't even talk about the past. He's talking about the future. And, and Jesus wants to commission you in the same way that he's commissioning Peter is, is that he's not looking at what you've not done or have done in the past. He's not looking at your, your, your epic fails or your shortcomings in the past. He's looking at what you can do in the future. That's how Jesus deals with failure, is looking to the future. Now, that's not to say that failure's good or we want it. It's just saying that's not, where, that's not where Jesus dwells. That's not what he's thinking about. He's thinking about the future because he sees what you can be, not what you have done. God doesn't hold your past failures against you. And if that's true, and it is, then who are you to hold your past failures against you? You better than God? <laughs> Can I say that again? If, if God doesn't hold your past failures against you, and He doesn't because we have His example in the Scripture here, if He doesn't hold it against you, then who are you to hold it against you? We gotta get we gotta get free of that, uh, because he wants to move you from epic failure to epic faith, and he did that with Peter, and he can do it. He can do it with you, uh, and so how do we do that? How do we go from epic 
failure to epic faith? Well, there's, there's three things. Uh, there's, there's probably a lot. I could have gone on a list of 30 things, but here's three for today. These are the biggies. Number one, understand that failure is an event, not a person. We have got to change the way we view and think about failure because we, we don't, most people don't view it biblically or well. A lot of people will say and believe, oh, I'm such a failure. I'm a failure. It's like you, you are not a failure. You may have failed, all right, but you yourself are not a failure. We have to learn to differentiate between that. And it's hard because a lot of people have been called a failure. Oh, they're a failure. Yeah. But, but mostly it's us. Mostly our own, our own thinking is what messes us up. We've, well, and the devil is feeding into that, obviously. Uh, but, but the devil is trying, trying to get us to, to, to convince us that, that our failures are being held against us and that we have forfeited our, our right to be used in the future. So we've, but we've got to change the way we think because it's our thinking that messes us up. Proverbs 23, 7, the, the first part of that in some translations in King James says, uh, uh, for as he thinks in his heart, so is he. <laughs> in other words, if you think it, that's who you think you are. If you think that's who you are, that's who you are. That's not true, but how can I say it? They say that perception is reality. That's not true. Reality is reality. But to you, when you're perceiving it, it seems real. Okay? So if you perceive yourself as a failure, that's what's going to manifest in your life. Failure. Right? If you see yourself as full of faith, full of faith, fueled by, by the power of God and by the presence of the Holy Spirit, that's what's going to manifest in your life. So as you, as you think in your heart, so are you. Right? And Paul said this in, in Romans 12 too. He says, um, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. All right? You have to change the way you think. If you want to be in God's will, if you want to be everything that he's called you to be, then you need to change the way you think. You have to line up your thinking with what the word says and what God says and not what the devil says or what you say or what the fox says. That's a joke. I, that one. I don't even, still don't know what he says. But anyway, I don't know where that came from. It's not in my notes. But anyway, <laughs> the, 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 the truth is, Peter dealt successfully with his failure. Judas did not. Right? Two disciples. Both of them betrayed Jesus. Right? I mean, oh, you might say, well, Judas was way worse. Well, maybe. I mean, Judas wasn't in the inner circle. Like Peter was, I mean, you, you you can make a case for it. Whatever it was, all, none of it was good, right? Judas or Peter, both what they did was bad. Judas was sorry for what he did. I mean, he he felt bad, so bad. What he do? He committed suicide. And I'm telling you, failure is a tool of the enemy. And failure, this this sense of failure has brought a lot of people to take their own life. They get so low, so loaded with guilt and shame and condemnation that they can't even face people. Like, I have, I'm, I have become so much of a failure, it would just be a favor if I just checked out and left so there's no more failure. I'm telling you, that's a lie of the enemy. And he uses it a lot. And nobody seems to be talking about this, at least very, I've not heard it very much, but the Lord says, we need to be talking about this because this... This, this lie of you are a failure is, is bringing people to, to take their own lives. And if they don't take their own life, their, their, their life is miserable and they're making a miserable life for people around them because it affects, it affects their relationships, right? Because when you, when you see yourself as a failure and you're going to manifest that, you're, you're going to expect your relationships to fail. <laughs> but the thing is, it's weird because we want relationships, right? We're wired to be in relationship with each other. And yet, when we have when, when this lie is at work in our life that we're a failure, then we're expecting our relationships to fail. And, and then when they do, it's like, see, I'm a failure. I blew it. And it just, it just it goes nowhere. It's a spiral down. I'm telling you, we've got we to gotta change the way we think about it. Satan wants you to be obsessed by your failures. 
He wants you to dwell on it. And he's going to, re- he's going to replay those tapes. And, and Well, tapes, that's old. The video, the, the M- MP4, he's going to, or whatever. He's going, to, he's going to replay that over and over in, in your head um, to, to try and remind you. He wants you to obsess over your failures. He wants to keep you there, and, and he wants to leverage that so, so much. Hopefully, you'll take your own life, but if not, then maybe you'll make everybody else's life around you miserable because of, of the big failure that you are. Satan wants to use your failures to rob you of your faith. It's interesting what Jesus said to Peter. Because he warned, Jesus warned Peter that this was going to happen. He warned him that, he said, before the rooster crows three times, you'll deny me. But do you remember what he said to Peter right before that? I'm going to read this to you, because this is interesting. Luke 22, verses 31 and 32, Jesus said, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift all of you as wheat. But I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. And when, when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. Is it not interesting that Jesus did not Jesus didn't pray Peter I'm praying that you will not fail. He didn't pray that, did he? What did he pray? Peter, I'm praying that your faith will not fail. Is that interesting? Because Satan wants to rob, he wants to use failure. He wants to leverage failure in your life to rob you of faith. And, and we can fail and still keep our faith, right? And, and Jesus knows that. He knows we're going to fail because <laughs> we're human, right? But in that failure, don't lose your faith. Judas lost his faith in his, fail, in his failure. His faith was lost. In Peter, it was not. What's the difference? How they dealt with it. Peter saw his failure as an event, not as a person. Judas saw his failure as a person. Him, Right? So, that's number one. (laughs) Understand that failure is an event. It's not a person. Number two, acknowledge your significance in Christ. Most people hate failure because of how they believe other people will will perceive them in their failure. Right? Because we search for significance, and this is not right, but... But so many of us search for our significance um, that comes from other people, right? We want to be significant to other people. We want to we get their accolades. We want to get their approval, right? So uh, for a lot of people, significant comes from what other pe- significance comes from other, what other people think about them. And so if, if you consider yourself a failure or you, when you think you fail, that people think less of you, then, then it, it messes you up. And, and here's the deal. You, you need to be secure in your significance in Christ. You are significant to God. Extremely significant. He knows all about you. The Bible says he knows the, the hairs on your head. Easier for some than others. But he knows everything about you. And he cares about you and he knows how to care about you. You, you think, well, it was easy. Peter was very significant to Jesus. Well, yeah, we're, we're looking through the, through the lens of hindsight. I mean, how significant do you think Peter felt after being that close to the Messiah, after being with him for three years and seeing what he did and, and being in that inner circle and then denying him? How, is, how significant do you think Peter felt? Not very much at all. But Jesus made him feel significant. Because he didn't go back to his past. He said, I'm going to use you, Peter. I'm going to use you. And he, and he wants to use you, too. He wants to use you. He wants to, to, to move you from epic failure to epic faith and use you in powerful ways. But you've got to receive God's grace and mercy. Grace is basically defined as unmerited favor from God. You can't earn it. Peter didn't earn God's grace. I mean, if if anything he earned is a kick in the pants, right? I mean, how would you feel if one of your best friends did that to you? 
I don't think I would have handled it probably like Jesus did. I'm trying to learn that I should, but I'd probably have to spend a couple days making that person feel bad about making me feel bad. You know, if I was real holy, you know, otherwise it'd be a week or a month or a lifetime. You know, if I can get it down to a couple days, we're doing good, right? Well, right, we want to make that person feel bad like I feel bad so they know how it feels. Right? Jesus doesn't do that. He doesn't do that. And he has grace for you. Un- you have his unearned favor. And you need to realize that. You also have his mercy. Mercy and grace kind of go together, but mercy is different in the sense that in mercy, you've done something wrong that deserves punishment, but you're not going to get it. Okay? So mercy is not getting what you deserve in the, in the bad sense. Grace is getting what you don't deserve. Right, in the good sense. That's grace and mercy. And, and God gives that. And Jesus extended that to Peter. And he's, ex- he's extending it to you. You have God's grace and mercy. So you can, you can be significant in him. If you weren't significant, he wouldn't offer it to you. <laughs> right? It wouldn't matter. That's how you know you're, sig- you're significant. And here's the thing. <sighs> oh, and God showed this to me this week. So I don't, know if, I don't know if you guys can chew on this meat with me or not, but this, this is something for me, and hopefully you'll get something over it. But you've got to get over your guilt about your imperfect love for Jesus. Because <laughs> here's, here, in that dialogue at that breakfast that morning, John 21, what Jesus asked Peter three times whether he loved him or not. Now we know that the reason he asked three times is because Peter denied him three times, Right? And so we, that was kind of part of the restoration process, right? And that's, that's cool. Great, got that. But in English, our word for love is, is love. In Greek, in which the New Testament was written in, there's basically three words for love. Eros, which is like a romantic love, like a sexual love. Um, phileo, which is like uh, affection, fondness. Um, like, I love the NFL. I love pizza. You know, I love... Chevys or four, whatever, you know, that's phileo. And you can love people in that way, right? Brotherly love, they call it the city of Philadelphia. It comes from phileo, city of brotherly love, all right? So you can love people with phileo. Um, and then there's agape, which is the highest form of love. That's the love that, that Jesus has for you. It's that sacrificial love. It's that 100% sold out, self-sacrificing love, all right? It's the highest form of love. And so... When Jesus is, is talking to Peter, asking if he loves him, the first time he says, Peter, do you agape me? In other words, Peter, do you have that sold out, sacrificial, 100% love for me? And Peter says, I phileo you. I'm, I'm fond of you. And he asks him again, the second time, Peter, do you, ha- do you agape me? Do you have that 100% sold out, go to the wall for me love? Lord, I, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm fond of you. <laughs> I phileo you. Right? You see what's going on here? Peter's finally being honest. He's like, I can't, I can't lie to you, Lord, because you know everything. And if I, I could tell, I'd like to tell you, Lord, I'm thinking that Peter might think this. I'd like to tell you, Lord, that I'm sold out for you. I'm going to the wall for you. I've told you that before. You know it's not true. So I can't, who's, I don't have, I, how can I lie now? I mean, because, Obviously, I didn't have that because didn't, I didn't do it. I am fond of you. I have affection for you. And then the third time, Jesus says, Peter, are you fond of me? Do you phileo me? Peter goes, you know, yes, you know everything. And Jesus commissions him to be like his first pastor in his imperfect love, right? Jesus is saying, Peter, do you love me perfectly? Kind, I'm paraphrasing. Peter goes, no, I, I, I love you with a less than perfect love. Peter, do you love me perfectly? I love you with a less than perfect love. Peter, do you love me with a less than perfect love? Yes. Let's go then. So, I believe what the Lord is saying, what I felt like he spoke to my heart is, get over the guilt of this less than perfect love we have for Jesus. Now, don't hear what I'm not saying. Okay? I am not saying 
don't love Jesus or it doesn't matter if you love Jesus or not. I am not saying that. I'm saying that we're humans and, and we want to say in our head, ah, oh, Jesus, I love you 100%. I am sold out. I'm going to the wall for you. There, we want to do like Peter did back in <laughs> John 17 or 18, wherever that was, right? But when it comes right down to it, do we really have that? And it's like, quit, get over the guilt and shame and condemnation of not having perfect love for Jesus. But, but, do, you ha- but do you have some love for him? I mean, do you? Because he can work with that. And I, I know that Peter went, as, as, as God began to use him, and as he began to get filled with the Holy Spirit, and, and he grew, I know that his love for Jesus grew, even more when he had returned to heaven than when he was there. I know that. And in, in awesome marriages, that happens too. People say, I'm more in love now than I was 30 years ago or whatever. Okay, so that can happen and that should happen in your life with Jesus. And I can say in my own life, my love for Jesus has grown. It's still imperfect. I still don't love Jesus perfectly. I want to, I, wanna, I wish I could step here and say, I have agape love for Jesus. And I have moments of agape love for Jesus. I do, I think. But I have moments when it's less than perfect. I have moments when it's, just, I'm, it's not sold out, go to the wall 100%, here we go. I have moments when it's just fondness. I wish it wasn't that way, but that's the way it is. I'm trying to get better at it. You know, we're on a journey, right? So I just, I just hopefully this ministers to somebody else other than me, that, that you've got to get over this guilt and shame and condemnation that the devil's trying to give you, that, that you don't love Jesus perfectly. Well, neither did Peter. And yet God used him powerfully, accepted him wholly, gave him grace and mercy and love, and he's significant, trusted him to be the pastor of the first big mega church, right? So if he can do that with Peter, he can do that with you, right? Number three. So well, number two is uh, uh, realize your, your uh, acknowledge your significance in Christ. Number three, immerse yourself in the Holy Spirit. So, just a week or two after these events of breakfast on the shore and this whole do you love me, Peter thing, okay? Uh, just a few days after that, they're um, in the upper room because Jesus had told them to go in the upper room and wait for the Holy Spirit. So there's 120 up there and Peter's one of them. And you can read about this in Acts 2. We're not going to read it today, but it's there that the Holy Spirit comes in. Now they had the indwelling of the Holy Spirit because remember in John 20, we... we that was last week's sermon, right? He breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. All right? So they, they had the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, which is their salvation. Right? Just like if you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, you have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. But the baptism of the Holy Spirit fell on them and just immersed them in the Holy Spirit. And, and that day Peter preached, 3,000 people get healed. Three, or, or saved. What's well, Spiritual healing. 3,000 people get saved in one day. Acts 5 tells us that Peter was so immersed in the Holy Spirit that he would just, when he would just walk down the street, there was such an atmosphere of power that surrounded him, people would get healed just in, being in his presence. He didn't even have to touch them. He didn't even have to say anything. He just walked by them, and there was such an a atmosphere of the Holy Spirit around him that people would get healed. I mean, that, that's amazing. And we've, we've said this we've, before and we'll say it again. The Holy Spirit is in you for you. He's on you for others. Jesus even said that. He said, the Holy Spirit is, has anointed me. The Holy Spirit is upon me. Right? Jesus had the Holy Spirit in him, but he also had it on him. When you are immersed in the Holy Spirit... You, are, you, you, have, you have him on you. And you have that, that atmosphere of power of God that just surrounds you. When you walk into a room, it should change the atmosphere of a room. And it does. You, you, you may have been in a room where somebody that's just full of the Holy Spirit walks in and it, just, it changes the atmosphere of the room, right? Have you noticed that? <laughs> if you have the atmosphere of epic fail on you, that can also change the atmosphere of a room as well, can it not? 
I mean, you felt that. People walk in, all of a sudden, oh, the spirit of Eeyore has just fallen upon us. <laughs> right? Oh, well. Right? And so you, you carry an atmosphere around you. The question for you this morning is, what atmosphere surrounds you? Do you carry an atmosphere of epic fail? <laughs> or do you carry an ap- uh, atmosphere of epic faith? Because you're, you'll, you'll carry one or the other, and so which one are you going to carry? And I, I, you know which one Jesus wants you to carry, right? So as you ponder that this morning, uh, worship team, come on up. We want to close this morning. And uh, prayer people, we're going to have you come forward too. We're going to close with a, a time of worship. I know we've gone over time a little bit. I appreciate your patience. I, um, uh, try and get out of here earlier, but sometimes we just got to say what we got to say. But uh, God's doing things. We don't want we don't want you to miss out on anything here. So as these prayer time people come forward, uh, we're going to enter into a, a time of worship. And here's what I know. I know that I know a lot of things in my head, but a lot of times they don't make the 18 inch trip to my heart. Right, and. And so when, they're not, when I have something in my head but not in my heart, I kind of have to struggle to live it out. It, it's, it's, they call it performance-based spirituality. It, it's kind of like, I know it, but I don't feel it, but I know it's right, so I'll do it. <clears throat> and most Christians live their life that way. What Jesus wants, he wants your, your head and your heart to line up. And that's what... Romans 12, 2 that we read talks about be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Yes, it's your mind, but it's got to hook up into your heart. Um, I, can, I can give you information that will, might change your brain thoughts, but only the Holy Spirit can give you that deep revelation into your heart. And so this morning as we worship, uh, I'm going to invite you to come forward to prayer, for prayer with these people. You can come for any reason you want for prayer. But I'm just saying you might want to come forward to get this idea that you were not a failure. I know you know that in your head because you just heard it, right? I know you know it here, but do you feel it here? I can't make you feel it here, but the Holy Spirit can. And if you'll come forward for prayer, these prayer time people are just going to, they'll just lay a hand appropriately on you and they're just going to pray that the Holy Spirit reveal that to your heart. Just like my words have revealed it to your head, the Holy Spirit can reveal it to your heart and that's what will change your life. That will change your life. So if you, if you felt like, man, I just had so many failures, I, be, I think I'm a, I don't know, whatever. You need to come and, and get the truth in that. Maybe you, maybe you don't feel significant in Christ. You know that you are, but you don't feel that way. Have these people pray that the Holy Spirit would just fill you with that knowledge in your heart. And maybe you feel like you're not immersed in the Holy Spirit. Like, okay, I've got, you, you've got the Holy Spirit in you, but not on you. <laughs> right? He's in you for you and on you for others. Do you, does your atmosphere uh, have the power of, of Christ through the Holy Spirit? If not, these people are going to pray that that power just become an atmosphere around you, the power of the Holy Spirit. They're going to pray that you be immersed in the Holy Spirit. So anything you need prayer in that way, come on up as we continue on in worship.